And today we're talking with Mr. Jerry Gust Augustin of Southampton, Pennsylvania, who served as a Marine aboard the battleship from 1955 to 1959, July 1955 to July 1959. He was qualified as a rifleman, and he served as a captain's orderly. Jerry, welcome. Thanks for talking with us. First question I want to ask is, how did you get to uh, come aboard the battleship New Jersey? How did you end up here? Well, when I joined the Marine Corps, one of the things I wanted to do, do was be seagoing. So I just signed up for seagoing. And uh, after I finished all the boot camp and the advanced infantry training, I went to sea school. And the Jersey happened to be in Norfolk at the time, and there were openings. And so I found myself being transferred to New Jersey, and that's how I came aboard. Tell us a little bit about sea school. What experiences did you have there? How did they train you to get ready to serve aboard a Navy ship? Well, of course, you know, you didn't know any terminology, Navy terminology. And so uh, you had to learn what the walls are bulkheads, the ceilings are overheads, the floors are decks, you know, the bathrooms are heads and all that kind of. So you wouldn't like to be completely out in left field. They taught you all that, a lot of terminology. And then they also uh, got you squared away with your uniforms. Because the first time you had a blue, we had a blue uniform. It taught us how, to wear, how they want us to wear them. That was a dress blue you Cor Correct, that's dress blue, it's a blouse and, the, and, uh, and, the, and got us kind of fitted up for them. And, uh, and they just, it was just a lot of what you would be doing aboard, what shipboard life like. And you'd be in fine quarters, they let us know that right off the bat. You're gonna be jam packed in with other, with other guys and uh, that's the way you're gonna have to live. There's small lockers, you gotta be organized, you gotta be orderly, so you have, so you do have room for everything, but if you're not organized and orderly, you won't have room. Side question, where did you hang your dress blues? One of the small, long, narrow lockers well, on a uh, hanger? Did you roll up your dress blues? No, in our, in our compartment, they had a big cabinet went on the wall and we hung what we used to call, was our overcoat, we used to call horse blankets, went with that in there and then our blue blouses and our and our green, we had a, also wore a green blouse and we had also, we would wear that hung up in there as well. And all your shirts, well, I can remember now, now you're stretching me now. Okay. <laughs> I believe we'll put them in our locker, but I'm not positive. So how much space did you have as an individual board ship? You had your bunk? Bunk. Uh, you had, how big was your locker to, besides a general locker for the green unit? How big was your wall locker? It was about maybe that big. That big. So and about that, two and a half by yeah, three, yeah. something like that. And that was it. And all your earthly belongings went in there. And with a series of shells and things like that. And, and it was just, they cost, it was constantly locker inspections and things like that to make sure you were, you were squared away. So instead of a locker box, you had a locker. Uh, Jerry, just to make a correction as we're talking with you, I said before that you had served on the New Jersey from 1955 to 59. However, that was your period of enlistment Correct. in the Marine Corps from July 1955 to July 1959. Right. You served aboard the battleship New Jersey from 1956 to 1957. Right. So we're talking a little bit about the, the living conditions in yeah. the Marine quarters down below. Mm -hmm. Uh, how did the guys get along with each other? I, I thought it was really good. What I can remember, we, we got along well, because we know we're all in the same boat and we got to make it. You got to get along. And, you know, you just can't. Oh, of course, they're not everybody was best of buddies with everybody, but certain guys you picked out and you were just good friends with them. And and uh, I, I liked it. I look back now and I thought, man, that, that was good. <laughs> that was good living. How old were you? Were you 18 when you were 18? I was 18. 18, just yeah. out of high school. Yep. Were most of the guys out of high school or high school? I think they're a little older than me. A little, a little older. I kind of think that. I was kind of on the young side. Because I joined the Marine Corps when I was 17. And so I just, I was 18 when I came aboard. 18 turned 19 when I was aboard. Talk to me a little bit about your shipboard duties as a Marine. Okay. Well, the Marines were responsible for quite a few areas. One was whenever we, the ship was in port, there were two gangways, a forward and an aft. The forward was just for officers. And there was always a Marine on the pier to make sure officers and officers alone came up that gangway. That's that when you first come aboard, that's where you go. And uh, and then we also had what the brig we had a brig aboard the ship at the time. And so you become trained to be a brig sentry. Where is the brig located? Well, it isn't on here anymore. I've looked. I've looked and they, they took it on one of the retrofits around 1985 or so. They they took it off. 
And of course, the Navy was very concerned about the guys drinking and stuff like this. They wanted to make exercise rooms. So they made, converted the brig into an exercise room, and it was one aft and one forward. And, uh, and so I look, 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 like, and I finally saw one of the fellows who was, I, who was on the ship during the war. We were looking for it one day, and I said, you know, Russ, I think this was it, because I can see where the spot welds were on the floor, where the walls were and the cells were and things like that. I said, this is probably if it's gone. So, so did, was there normally people in the brig? Oh, what, a lot of times, yeah. That was a quite a, not all the time, but a lot of times. What were. would they be in the brig for? Or some M- mostly, mostly uh, drinking and fighting and uh, going AWOL, you know, way without leave, or just coming back late. Or, uh, and a lot of it stemmed, a lot, a lot of, I would say most of it stemmed from, from the drinking on shore. And then the yes, shore patrol guys want to bring it back. They get mouthy with them, and the next thing you know, they're taking a swing at them. Next thing you know, they're written up. Next thing you know, we find them in, in the brig. Yep. What happens when you're at sea? What would be a brig offense? Fighting? That would get guys to get uh, thrown in a brig? I don't, I can't remember why. We know we'd go to, go to ports. Mm-hmm. They go to foreign ports. Right. And then that's when the trouble would start. That's the brig yep. would fill up. Yep. And what would happen? The captain, the executive officer would always have what they call a mast. And that's when the offenses got to the point, we got to do something about this guy. They take him up to the executive officer and the executive officer would, would pronounce sentence. If it was a first time offender and it wasn't a bad thing, he'd get maybe two weeks extra duty. He'd scrub the range in the, in, the, in, the, in the galley or something like that, or they'd do some dirty scroungy work somewhere or something like that for a couple weeks, or they'd restrict him to the ship and, or things like that he would give him to do. Or, or keep him from going on liberty for a couple of weeks or something like that. And then, and then if it got to be serious, it's okay, I'm sending you up to captain's mess. When you went to captain's mess, nothing good came out of that for the troops. Because the captain, and the reason I did this, because being exec's order and a captain's order, I'd beat at the mess. So I'd see all the stuff that was going so on. So as a captain's orderly and the executive officer's orderly, you would, you would be standing there. Curry off to the side. So you had a lot of insight then into shipboard uh, oh, yeah. punishment. Yeah, judicial system, the way it worked. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. And, uh, and then you go to captain's mass, and, and the captain knew these guys were a repeat offenders or something like this, and he would say, okay, that's enough, three days bread and water. Mm-hmm. And then, there they go to jail. And it, mm-hmm. he'd give them, in the morning, you'd give them three or four slices of, of bread and a glass of water. Mm-hmm. It for the day. What, day one, day two, day three. If they were in for six days, the end of the third day, they would. You have to take them to the mount, to the galley for a mess deck for one good meal. Back in again for three more days, bread and water, mm-hmm. or they court martial and whatever the case might be. But, but uh, that, that's that's how they got there. And or the captain would take a strike from them. Mm-hmm. All kind of bad stuff happened to the captain's mess. Nothing was good there. Uh, what was the most serious punishment you saw meted out for the most? Let's say for the most serious. Crime, if you will, or breaking a rule. What was the most serious breaking well, rules you saw? I remember when not, not on the, in the Jersey when the Jersey was decommissioned the, first, the second time in Brooklyn, mm-hmm. I transferred over to the uh, carry Intrepid, mm-hmm. and I became exec orderly then. And and uh, I saw one, one of our Marine staff sergeants broken down to a sergeant, took a straight ball. That to me was a horrible thing. That was absolutely I can because it takes a long time to go from sergeant to staff sergeant. That's a big jump, and and uh, I thought that was absolutely horrible. And and I thought, oh, where did he get broken at rank? Well, he did? no, he just got some. He got tricky. You know, they went to Cuba. You know, and there was a Cuban guy there in a boat at Guantanamo Bay, and he would sell pineapples, and and uh, he would just he'd cut off all the stuff at the top and skin it for you, so it'd hold like almost like an ice cream cone. And they were so sweet and delicious. He'd walk around them. Well, this sergeant bought a whole bunch of them off this guy. And he was selling them to the Marines on a ship. <laughs> that was, the captain didn't think that was too great of a thing to do. And so he said, that's enough of that. Down a strike. You know, so he took a straight ball. So was shipboard um, discipline run fairly strictly for the Oh, yeah. yeah they, they didn't play around. They did not play games. They couldn't. They could not play games. You could not have people getting away with stuff. And usually division officers tried to handle the cases. And a division officer is a person in charge of one of the divisions. Correct. How many divisions were uh, on the ship when you were here? Eight, nine? Oh, uh, yes, maybe about 10, ten divisions. I guess maybe. And each division slept together, yep. worked together, yep. did like, their basic work together, and they like went off and did their specialty jobs. Yep, or on engineering, or a gunnery, or a, the deck crew, or whatever, you know, that, that was a division. And the Marines were a division too. 
or we were called a detachment. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, we had a captain for Marine captain and lieutenant in charge of us. How did the Marines and Navy personnel get, get along? I guess it depends on the people. You know, I got along with guys with no problem. I had, I, I guess I would tend to be a people person. So I, I made point, made a point to got, get to know people. And, and but I guess because we, uh, we used to go, because you, you have you have to depend on each other. You know, if you need a haircut, you get the sailors down there. And we got to go to some sailor down by number two turret or something, and he'd cut your hair. You now rather than staying in a long line for them, so you you depend on each other for doing things. Talk to us a little bit about being a captain's and executive officer's orderly. Well, the captain's orderly on this ship was which I was a lot of the time. It, when I walked in here this morning, it's the first time I've been in this cabin since 1957. And I just walked down memory lane. It was just unbelievable. And it was different because I had spent a lot of time in this, in this, in this cabin. Because whenever we were in port the, and the captain was ashore, you came in here. That's where you stood. So when, you stood inside? The yes. Oh, yeah, we came. And this cabinet it housed all the civil wars donated from the state of New Jersey to the battleship. And it was over there. And the captain, right behind where you're sitting, had a great big oak roll-up desk. And on top of it, he had a trans, big trans world radio. And I remember those, I remember that mostly about the ship, because you'd stand in here for your whole four hours. And stand at attention. I want to put parade rest, to have parade rest like that, yeah. And, and if we're not, and if when, when the captain was on board, you were out in the passageway out here. There's a second passageway where there was a ladder coming up. You stand right there. And, and that's where you would just, and if anyone wanted to see the captain, you come in and ask the captain if he wanted to see them. And then if the captain said yes, then you let him in. Otherwise, forget it. Because he didn't want anyone to see the captain. He might be busy doing something, who knows? Who, no. was, who, were the, uh, who was the captain that you served on? It was Captain Brooks is the one I remember yeah. the most, yeah. I remember when the ship, and I must have been in late 57, or 56 rather, or sometime around there, went up to Annapolis, and that's where he came aboard as the, as the new CO. What was he like as a CEO? Stern. I don't remember him being a, he wasn't very talkative. That I remember, what I saw of him, he was just, just a business, a business thing. You had no, no idle conversation. You got business to tell me, tell me, you know? And, uh, and then when we were at sea, it was, you'd, when you were Captain Zotto, you'd be up on the bridge. And the captain was sitting in his chair, you'd stand up somewhat behind him. So that he, he, whenever, and they would say, orderly, you come up there, you go up, I need Lieutenant so-and-so. And, -so. and you have to know all the officers on the ship, who they hung out with, where their staterooms were, where their, where their uh, uh, offices were, where their duty stations were, where their buddy, everybody. And so you'd have to go find that guy. He didn't want to see him an hour and a half later. He wanted to see him as soon as you could. You have to run very quickly. You, you had, yeah. So consequently, you got to know the ship pretty well. Yeah. Was that a... Considered a good duty being orderly, or uh, go ahead. It was good. I thought it was great. Why? Well, it, I just liked it. I liked I liked wearing a uniform. Mm -hmm. I liked just being able to do that part of the job. I thought it was so neat to be able to be involved with the, the CO of the ship, mm -hmm. you know. And and I just thought it was it was a good, a, really a good job. And was in a in a Marine thing. You, it was a brow, your brow, brig sentry, your captain's order, executive orderly. And we stood honor guards, and that was the other thing we did. We did a, stood a lot of honor guards. And, you know, you pull into a foreign port, and the ambassador from the U.S. or the king or the queen or the, some dignitaries that come on board, we'd have an honor guard for them. And we did that quite often. And that was a neat part of our job, too. I mean, I liked everything we did. You had a good time before you Oh, it. I thought that was great duty. Yeah, yeah I really liked it. How does your duty compare to the rest of the Marines who are FMF Fleet Marine Force? or troop carriers, or on ground, say Camp Lejeune, Okinawa, when you would run into them in port, so did they envy you? Did you ever envy them being in, in infantry, infantry units, or what was interest in that? Well, I, I really didn't, I don't think I ran into some guy, any guys from the Fleet Marine Force or anything like that, but when I went to Lejeune as a rifleman, I liked that too. I adjusted and turned up, oh, this is really great too. You know, this is really a neat thing. I like being out in the woods, I like, the sweat and the carrying of packs and the marches and the shooting and all that. I, it was all just fine with me. I, I, I it was a great, it was a great part of my life too. And how about your the serving aboard a battleship like New Jersey, which has a, a great history behind it? Uh, 
uh, a great what? Which has a great history behind it. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, uh -huh. Which was well known for its battles in World War II, then sure support in, in the Korean War, uh, Cold War actions. Did that, as a young man, young Marine, did that strike you in any way? You know, I don't even know if I really knew all the history of the Jersey, just that I knew it was a, a big player in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And, but I don't know if I knew all that. And, and I was just so excited about being about, you know, 17, 18 year old kid, all of a sudden I'm finding myself going to Norway, mm -hmm. you know, and to England and to Scotland and all these places, this was great. And, uh, and so I, I really wasn't into the history like I am now. I, I, I just, well, now that I look back, say, that was really an honor to be on that ship and, and to still have it and now to work on it and to help restore to its former glory days, you know? I think that is so neat to do. When you went ashore as a Marine on, on, uh, on leave for a few days and the ship was in port, uh, did you feel you were representing the United States or you go out and just have a good time as an 18 year old would do? Oh, no, no, I, I was very conscious of my uniform mm -hmm. and what it stood for because the thing is our Marine captain was Captain Shepard. Captain Shepard. Yep, and he didn't ask for excellence, he demanded it. And, and so, so when we went back, you better come back squared away. I mean, you better not go and get your uniform all messed up and you can't find your glove, you can't find your, you know, all, you better come back squared away or he's going to be all over your case because he just ex wants you to wear, you, you said, you're a Marine, you want to wear a uniform? This is the way you wear it. And he set standards for us to wear uniforms and you better stand by those uniform. And I was, as a young guy, grew up real fast and found out how real fast he wanted to wear that uniform, all the little tricks he needed to know to make it a little sharper and to, you know, and so you couldn't, you couldn't. Sorry. I don't get shoot. I get too many hands. Yeah, I better talk with my mouth instead of my hands. <laughs> we're hearing a good story. I'm like getting as high as I can. So it's still out of the shot. Okay. In fact, I saw, I, I really liked wearing that uniform because I knew what wearing was right. I was wearing it correct and I was proud of it. And so I know I didn't carry one. When I went to shore, I didn't, I didn't carry one anywhere. You know, I just got my stuff, bought my sweaters in Norway and stuff like that and bought my, went on a tour to London and things like that, you know, on, a, on a, that four day leave. And, and I, but I never, I never. What happened to guys who didn't follow regulations and got a little carried away? Man, this is unbelievable. We'll hold that thought. What happened to the guys? Yeah, the question. Let me put a hook in a pocket. I that help? Yeah. It's got like right under your chin. Oh, okay. What I'm going to do? I'm going to tape it. See if this helps. He's a Marine. Get nails out. Nail it to his chest. Right? Oh, no problem. No tape. He's a Marine. <laughs> yeah, nail, yeah. <laughs> what would happen to Marines who didn't follow the account? Uh, well, uh, I, I've seen guys come back, they're missing their buttons on their thing, they trade in with some other guy for something. Take them to task. You know, they're restricted. They're this, they're that, you know. So you get old, replace all this stuff, you know, and it's just, it wasn't a good thing. And I said, I'm not going to be that way, you know, and I'm going to, that's, that's what I wanted to do. In fact, one, one time when I was captain's order, which I'll never, ever forget, I was standing at parade rest, like right over there, right on the side of his desk. It was New Year's Eve, 1956, going on 57. I had the 8 to 12 watch. It was about 11 o'clock at night. I said, there's absolutely nobody, nobody going to be on this ship or check me now. Because there's no one here. Every, the only people are here on the ship. We're in Norfolk. The only people in, in the ship are the guys who are on watch. So I, I was standing just like I'm supposed to, parade rest, doing everything exactly right. About 11 o'clock. I remember that, trans, that radio was right there, and I, I turned that on, and I shouldn't have done that, and but I did because nobody's going to check me out. And and uh, at that time, Elvis Presley happened to be in his heyday. He was singing "Hound Dog" or "Heartbreak Hotel" or someone things like that, and and that door opened, and I can see like it happened yesterday morning. That leg came in like this. And I knew who it was, it was our Marine captain, checking the guard, New Year's Eve, 11 o'clock. And he walked over to me, because Marine officers trousered their blue trousers, a little bit bluer, red stripe, a little bit wider, a little bit redder. And he walked right over to me, he said, Augustine. I mean, you know, and we had, we had, 
So we're just we're talking, uh, Jerry, about your some experiences of being a captain's orderly. Orderly. Uh, you mentioned something about being on duty on a New Year's Eve. Okay. And, about that, if you can. And so, uh, the, the layout of the captain cabin was different. This was over there. The cabinet was over there. Well, the cabin with the silver. Well, the, the silver, silver was right. over there. Yeah, and his desk was right behind where you folks were sitting now, and it was a big, big oak roll-up desk, and it had a big transport radio on the top, that I'm sure now we could probably fit in our back pocket. Same thing, but uh, uh, it, it was I was eight to, eight to twelve watch. I'm 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 saying pray to rest exactly like I should be doing, and I know when Captain Shepard came up, he looked through those portholes. And just to see who was in here. And if, it, if I was sitting down, I'd been dead meat. And who was Captain Shepard? Captain, he was our Marine captain. Marine captain. Yep. And squared away, as squared away can possibly be. And he's epitome of a Marine. And uh, uh, he, 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 well, I'm saying, I'm, my back was to him, so I didn't see him. And about 11 o'clock, I turned on that radio. I was Presley singing Heartbreak Hotel, Hound Dog, something. And that door opened. And the captain's leg, I can still see the captain's leg. It was yesterday coming in that room. And, uh, and he walked right over to me and I gave him do my thing with my pistol like that. And, and, uh, and he asked him, Augustine, I may have your general orders. So I started rattling off my general orders. And, uh, and he said, very good, Augustine. Stepped back, smiled, said, happy new year and walked out. And I thought, I'm dead meat. I'm done. I, I'm absolutely done. Something's going to happen to me tomorrow. Never said a word. And, and in fact, he recommended for corporal when I, when it got off the ship about a month and a half or so later. And, he gave me the ship I wanted. I wanted to go on the Intrepid. So, so it was it was a good relationship I had with him, and uh, and he was so squared away, and I just loved being squared away, and I just took and even when you know it, just the way you do things, and he just taught us certain ways to dress, and that was it. He and taught he, you a way of living. Yep, and he wouldn't accept anything other than that. I came back off Liberty one time, and he was on the on the aft deck, and my my web belt. It wasn't perfectly straight with my buckle. He said, ah, oh, Augustine, come here, man, your buckle. And it was off like one little line on the web like that. I said, excuse me, sir. And that, that's how he'd check you. I mean, he was, I said, you didn't miss a trick. And so, but I, he was a, just a great guy. He was a marvelous officer to, officer to have your, as your CO. And just, just a score. Did he ever help him in any way if they're in a jam or like he helped you? He cut your little- Probably horse. did. He never said anything about it, you know? So he probably did other guys as well. I know he had some of the sergeants, the guys who were most squared away are the guys who really he really took care of, and you know. And in fact, one time, another. Can I tell another story? Sure, go right ahead. <laughs> I was out here. The captain, we're in port. The captain was in the cabin. I was staying out there in the passageway, and uh, we're in Norfolk. And a guy comes up that ladder, and he goes, "I don't see the captain." I said, "Sorry, sir, you cannot see the captain unless I know who you are." He said, I want to see the captain. I said, sorry, sir, you, unless you identify yourself, I cannot allow you to see the captain. Kind of burly guy. And he made a move to get, and I, and I stood in the, in the front of the captain's door. And I said, sir, you, if you tell me who you are, I will introduce you to the captain. He said, and he regrettably went to his wallet, picked out, pulled out his ID card, and here he was a two-star admiral. In civilian clothes, I had no clue who he was. I opened that, that door and I say, Captain Admiral, and he did a bull rush right past me in the city, hot as can be. But you know, I'm only doing my job. That's what I'm, that's what I'm to do, you know? And I'd rather take heat on that end mm -hmm. than have somebody come in here and knock the captain on the head or something like that and take heat for letting him in, sure. you know? So, so that was my other story about being captain's order. That, that it was just one of those things that just happened, you know, that I just stood my ground and he knew I wasn't going to back up. You probably kept yourself out of trouble for really doing the job the way you're supposed to do it. Yeah. I was, I was a Marine PFC. Here's a two-star Admiral. <laughs> Did you have rounds in your chamber? Did you start the lock? Oh, no, no, no. I never got pissed. I just stood in front of the door. I, you know. Final question. Um, how did the Marine, your experience aboard in New Jersey impact or affect your later life? Well, I, you know, I just, I, I think that, that you learn discipline. You learn, you learn to be self-reliant. Nobody's going to help you. You got to do it yourself. They'll tell you what to do, but you got to do it. And, uh, and well, through that was the whole time through the Marine Corps. But, but I mean, on New Jersey, I really learned how, to, how it's like to, to, to be squared away, to be ready for all the time, you know, and not just let things go, but get things done and done on time and be ready. And, uh, and then now, as I, as I come back one night, when I saw the ship was coming into Philadelphia, a friend of mine got tickets for me, went out some kind of a little boat, and we saw the uh, Jersey come in. 
and it's the first I've seen it, you know, since 57. And all kind of memories just flooded through your mind, just, just flood through your mind of the things that happened on there. And I said, man. So I went home and I, I, I got on the internet and I just tried to find some, some address or something, some, a phone number. And I got some kind of numbers and, uh, and I called them. It wasn't the right number, but that's okay. I just wanted a phone number. And they said, oh, that's the wrong number. Here's the number you want. And they hooked me up to Home Port Alliance. So I called them. And uh, they said, oh, so. so they sent me all the information to sign the waiver and all this stuff, filled it, came down here. And I just love coming down here. I mean, I live in Bucks County in Pennsylvania. And I have a 60 some mile round trip, you know, to come here. But I just like working with these guys. You know, they, 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 these, are, these are all can do guys. And no matter how hot it is, how hard it is, what is, we can do it. Let's do it. And you don't see people complaining. We just go ahead and do the job. And I just love that attitude. And I just love and listen to their stories. Like, like uh, Sam sat in here. Just I love listening to their stories. And I just t- eat that stuff right up. And, and these, guys are, these guys wrote history. A lot of these guys I'm working with actually literally wrote history. And so I, and I, just, I just love being around them. And I think it's, neat, it's a neat experience. And I cannot wait for it to become a, a, a museum site because I put in for a tour guide. And I love to be a tour guide. Just, They're looking for tour guides. Yeah, I, I've signed up. I'm ready. Final, final thoughts. Is there anything that you want to say that I might not have asked or examined? Any final thoughts? Uh, no, not, not that I can think of. I have my cute little stories, and, mm-hmm. and uh, I can't think of any others offhand. Other than the fact it was just great duty. I was, it was like one guy said to stay in the form of the service. Like, oh, Gus had a, had a cool job, and, and it's exactly what I had. And I had a cool job. Sounds like you had a great time. I did. I did. I just love being on here and I love being on this this, Marine Corps. Marine Corps is no problem for me. I just ate it up.